Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sonoma Valley Church of the Nazarene. Thanks for coming out and hanging with me again this week. Hey, last week we jumped right back into the gospel, according to Mark, as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we asked the questions, what must he have been thinking and feeling as he entered into this final phase of his ministry? And what is it that God really wants from us as his divine image bearers? We wondered about Jesus' hopes and his expectations, even as he expressed his exasperation with the fig tree that was all leaf and no fruit. Our story today feels an awful lot more like a heavyweight boxing championship. It makes me think of the uh, match between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier back in 1975, dubbed the Thrilla from Manila. In this corner, we've got the current uncontested heavyweight champions of the world, the temple leadership. And in this corner, Jesus, the challenger from Nazareth. This week, the confusion about his identity continues as our two contestants continue to size one another up. Is Jesus the prophet who has come to pronounce judgment on Israel's leaders? Is he the king who has come to rule and to reign and restore Israel to her former glory? Is he the priest who has come to replace the current leadership and become Israel's great high priest and mediator between God and the people? Now, at last we left off, Jesus had just cursed a fig tree for not bearing any fruit. And he was outraged because those who had come to worship at the temple couldn't, either because they were Gentiles or because they didn't have enough financial means to do so, because they were being cheated by the money changers. And he loses it. He has some real human emotions. He turns over the tables of all those who, in pretense of God's service, were taking advantage of those who had come to worship. And so... He he is confronted by the temple leadership, asking him, by whose authority are you doing these things? I mean, you didn't come to us for permission, which on the surface seems kind of legit. I mean, if somebody came in here and started tossing stuff around, I might have some questions for them as well. But Jesus has got a question for them too. He wants to know if John's baptism was ordained by God or wasn't it. He wants to know if they would recognize what God was doing among them, saying that he would answer their question if they would answer his. Now, it's interesting to me that this question about Jesus' authority is sandwiched in between the incident with the fig tree that we looked at last week, which symbolized God's judgment upon his covenant people for their lack of spiritual fruit, and this parable that we're going to be looking at this morning about a vineyard that will serve as Jesus' answer to their question. There seems to be some connection between the fruitlessness of the people and the quality of of these religious leaders. Now, this is Passion Week, and he sets up this confrontation with the temple leadership, beginning with a parable. Before we get into our text, let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord, we come here today asking you to, to be in our presence. As we open up your sacred text today, I pray that you would meet us in this place that you would be our teacher, that your spirit would give us ears to hear what you have to say to your church. But mostly I pray that having heard from you, that we would be moved, that we would be challenged, and we would be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now there is an awful lot of back and forth in this particular chapter, and I doubt that we're going to have time to get through it all. But something I noticed in my reading this week is how Jesus began his engagement with these religious leaders, speaking to them in the voice of a prophet. And you know what? Nobody likes a prophet. The second thing I notice is how they respond to Jesus with a political question. After all, he had just ridden into Jerusalem looking like the next king of Israel. Remember, at this point, they're still trying to size each other up, and they're wondering whose side is this guy on anyway. Then something else I noticed is that these political questions are followed by two more theological ones, questions that you might ask either a priest or a rabbi. And Jesus says, God answers them. Let's check it out. Beginning in verse 1, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press, and he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. Now at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect some of the fruit from his vineyard. But they seized him, and they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them, and he struck this man in the head and treated him shamefully. Still, he sent another and that one they killed. And he sent many others. Some of them they beat, and others they killed. Now he had one left, his son, whom he loved. And he sent him last of all, saying, Surely they will respect my son. 
But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will then be ours. So they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? Well, he will come, he will kill those tenants, and he will give the vineyard to another. Haven't you heard the passage in Scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the, the chief cornerstone? Quoting from Psalm 118 here, Mark intends his listeners to identify the builders as the temple leadership and the stone as Jesus, the beloved son. The chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, and so they left and they went away. And so round one goes to the challenger. Now, I don't think this parable has a lot, needs a lot of explanation. It's pretty straightforward. But in this passage, it says that they went away. And this parable comes from Isaiah chapter 5, where the prophet sings a song about a vineyard. But these men's pride and their ego, egos are offended at this public embarrassment. And so they want to have him arrested and put in prison. Now, Jesus came to town with a reputation that had preceded him. And his words were not just taken as an insult. Jesus was clearly perceived as a threat. And he's hugely popular with the people. And the question is, where should they set the threat level? Now, I don't know if these guys came back later the same day or whether this is another day, but this time they come back with some questions for someone with political aspirations, someone who would be king. And so picking up our story again in verse 13. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Now, you guys remember the Herodians were a sect of the Jewish Pharisees who were loyal to King Herod and to the Roman Empire. And so they come with this question. Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity, that you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay it or shouldn't we? Now, the question is, have you come to set up your own political alliance with Rome? Because if you have, we've already done that. And it was common in those days for lesser kingdoms to pay tribute or protection money to bigger, more powerful kingdoms or empires. And so again, the question is, is are you with us? But Jesus wasn't going to fall for any of this kind of a blatant trap. And Mark tells us that he recognized their hypocrisy and he asked them, why are you trying to trap me? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And so they brought him a coin and they asked him, and he asked them whose image and whose inscription are on it. Well, Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what belongs to him and give to God what belongs to them. Now at this, they were amazed. Now the next question comes from a whole new group of questioners, the Sadducees who make their first and only appearance in Mark's Gospels. Now the Sadducees were part of a wealthy religious and priestly aristocracy. They weren't all priests, but they were religious scholars and part of the ruling elite that attended to all things in the temple. And they pose a more theological question. Again, one you might usually ask a rabbi or a priest. And this one's a little bit more troubling. I've even heard it be a source of concern for people in the church today. And so the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with this question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife with no children, the man must marry his widow and raise up an offspring for his brother. Now here's the problem. There were seven brothers. The first one married the, and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died without leaving any child. The same was for the third. In fact, all seven of them left without any children. Last of all, the woman also died. So at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since she married all seven? And this is a really strange question to be asking uh, for somebody who doesn't believe in a resurrection. But Jesus has got an answer for them. He says, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. All right, pause for just a moment. This is where a lot of people in the church today get hung up. Many people I know get really worried when Jesus says that there won't be any marriage in heaven. But that is not what this is about. This is about leave a right marriage. And I know we've talked about this before. This is a speculative problem concerning the obligation of brother to marry his sister-in-law and foster children in order to secure the brother's posterity and ensure the family remains intact, the family line remains intact. 
The question of whether or not we are still married in heaven is not what Jesus is talking about here. And I honestly have no idea whether we will still be married in heaven, or it's just until death do us part. But according to Jesus' words, marriage as we know it here will no longer be necessary in heaven for the purpose of procreation. The intimacy that we enjoy in the marriage relationship this side of heaven is intended in some small way to mirror the, the intimacy that we will enjoy with God someday in a non-sexual way. The intimacy that is a result of the union between two people here on earth below is the closest thing that we will ever have this side of heaven to understanding what, that, what our experience will be like one day. Now, in heaven, this intimacy will be more broadly applied to everyone. Now, I want to be careful here because I am not saying that people who are single can't enjoy the kind of intimacy that we're talking about here. That is not what I am saying. There are other human relationships that can provide the similar kind of intimacy as in marriage, which is why this isn't about whether or not we are still married in heaven. But as for me, if the intimacy of marriage and family that we enjoy down here on earth is not part of the resurrected life, then I am going to be very disappointed. But this passage does not address that question. And Jesus continues. Now about the dead rising. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him that he is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are badly mistaken. You guys can't buy a clue. Now, Unlike the Pharisees, the Sadducees come right at Jesus. They make no attempt at flattery. Their question is clearly hostile, and Jesus criticizes them on two fronts. In their error about not knowing the scriptures, and that they do not know the power of God. And these are religious leaders. They are supposed to know the scriptures. Now about the resurrection, Jesus is not suggesting that when we are changed into our new heavenly bodies, that we are going to be the same type of creature as the angels. We were never created to be a different kind of angel. We were made in God's image. And we have some of the same characteristics. Now, concerning their lack of understanding about God's power, it could be that Jesus is making the point that if God has the power to create, and if he can enable people to live beyond the grave like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then God can certainly raise somebody from the dead and transform them into a new creation at the age to come. And, one of the, and then one of the teachers of the law came and heard him, them debating, noticing that Jesus had given a good answer. And he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And without missing a beat, Jesus, quoting from the Shema, says, uh, the most important one is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There are no commandments greater than these. Well said, teachers, the man replied. You're right in saying that there is one God and there is no other but him. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your understanding, with all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Well, this seems like a pretty good place for us to pause for today. But last week I asked, what does God really want from us? And I said, he wants us to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly. He wants us to let our light shine among men so that they might see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Jesus wants us to love God with all of our heart, with all of our understanding and our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. These power brokers do not react well to being confronted by their corruption, their injustice, or their abuse. And these leaders react to being exposed. And so there is a call to silence the opposition, even if that means putting Jesus to death. As the saying goes, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, when I read a passage like this, it makes me wonder, what kind of leader am I? Do I bear any resemblance to these religious leaders? Is the church today suffering because of the quality of its leadership? We remember that Jesus rode in to the city and he overlooked it and he wept for the people. And looking back, God had sent his John the Baptist to the people asking them to repent. But the people were all leaf and no fruit. Jesus had asked the leadership if they would acknowledge John's ministry, but they wouldn't. The warning lights were flashing, but they couldn't see it. 
And so because they wouldn't commit one way or the other, Jesus calls them out on that. There's no indication on any of their parts that they were willing to change or to repent. And so I ask again, what about me? What about us? And what kind of fruit am I or are we bearing? Would we even recognize a new work of God if we saw one? And do I carry the same burden for the lost as Jesus? Because there is clearly a connection between the fruitlessness of the people and the quality of their religious leaders. The religious leadership were looking for any reason to reject Jesus. And when leadership fails, so go the hearts of the people. A question we might ask ourselves is, does your pastor's heart and Jesus' heart beat as one? My heart aches for people without hope in Christ. Jesus rode into Jerusalem knowing that he was going to die. But I wonder if we can view his interactions with these religious leaders as his trying to reason with them in the hope that maybe, just maybe, he could change one heart. And there were, of course, hearts that Jesus did change. I'm thinking of guys like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And there are probably others whose names we don't know. But what if this story had been different? What if the religious leaders and the people would have repented? Jesus, of course, knew that some would, others wouldn't. But I wonder, would any of that mattered? Would Jesus have gone to the cross anyway? Jesus said, I tell you the truth, that all the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. So my question, or my answer to that question, would be yes. Let's pray. Lord, my prayer today is that you would give us hearts that would beat with Jesus. I pray that you would give me the same compassion that he had for those who he came to save. Make me an instrument that's useful in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we've got time for one more song before we close, but I'll be back with the benediction in a moment, so please stick around.
And now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Thank you for joining me today. God bless you. Go in peace.